that this is of mega importance when we look at what's going on in the world, we look at what's happening in the church, we look at what's happening in homes and in hearts. Uh, it is very, very important that we understand the relationship between the law and the gospel. Not only now, not only for our, our spiritual lives, but as we move into the final crisis, we've got to have a real clear understanding of the subject. And there's a lot of confusion out there. So why don't we pray? Let's uh, bow our heads and have a prayer and ask the Lord to give us the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. Sound good? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this camp meeting that we can all be gathered together here uh, under this tent way out in the high deserts of, other, of Oregon. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will come into this tent and come into our hearts and help us to understand uh, the Bible and what it means to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, well, let's take a look at this verse. Revelation 14, verse 12. Verse 12 is actually the conclusion of the three angels' messages. Revelation 14, 6 to 12 describes messages that come from angels flying in the sky, announcing to the world uh, different Bible truths. And in verse 12, we have the conclusion of the third angel. Verse 12 says, here is the patience of who? The of the saints. Right, the saints. Now, sometimes we have a hard time with that word, saint. Uh, in the Bible, really, there's really only two groups at the end of the day. When it's all said and done, when the final uh, dust settles in the history of the great controversy, there's going to be only two groups. There's going to be the, the saints, and what's the other group? The sinners. the sinners, that's right. The sinners and the saints, two groups. And sometimes we, we think, well, I, I don't think I'm a, uh, a saint. I certainly don't want to be a sinner. But if you're not a saint, and if you're not a sinner, then what are you? Uh, there's really, okay, dead, somebody said. Yeah, ultimately in the Bible, there's really only two groups. And I've been, uh, I've been just impressed as I finished reading recently the book of Proverbs, how, how distinct the contrast is. It talks about the wise and the foolish. It talks about the righteous and the wicked. It talks about the just and the unjust. Uh, very clear distinctions between two groups. And the book of Revelation is also clear, and the New Testament is clear, that God does want to develop a people called saints. And then there's the sinners. And the reality is, we all start out as sinners, right? Everybody. Uh, we're all, and Paul even said, I am chief sinner. So he recognized that he still was faulty, and he needed more of Jesus. But uh, anyway, God is in the business of taking sinners and transforming them into saints. So if you don't feel like you're a saint uh, right now, if you know that you still have more progress to be made in your life, you can still be encouraged by the fact that God is in the business and he's committed to taking sinners and transforming them into saints. And Revelation 14, 12 uh, describes the saints. These are the people that God has finally put his stamp on. Finally, um, his people have been developed. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. And then the saints are uh, defined or described as having two characteristics. They, they, uh, it says that they keep. Here are they that keep. And what's their first characteristic? The right. They keep the commandments of God. That's characteristic number one. And then I, I guess you could say their first characteristic, actually there's more. It says here is the patience. The word patience means endurance. So that's one of their characteristics. Another characteristic is that they are saints. And so then you could add another, a third characteristic is that they keep the commandments of God. And then what's their fourth characteristic? Faith. Right, they have the faith of Jesus. Now this is really a mighty verse, isn't it? It's a verse that brings in together in a balance 
different truths. Saints, endurance, keeping the commandments, and having the faith of Jesus. And I like, as I look at the third angel's message, uh, it has impressed me that at the end of verse 12, there is a period. The last part of verse 12 has a period. And what is the word or the name right before the period? What's the last word before the period at the end of the last message, which is the third angel? Jesus. It's Jesus. That's right, Jesus. And then it says period. And that has impressed me that the final word is Jesus. Amen. Final word of the third angel. Now, if you look at these two different parts, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, it's, it's a challenge for the Lord working with humanity to help people to find the right balance between the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Uh, if you look at, at history, it's like a pendulum has been going back and forth, back and forth. And the pendulum is swinging today. As I've thought about this, if you go back to the time of, of Jesus, you have a very, a very uh, religious group of people, the Pharisees, and they were uh, strong believers in the scriptures. And when Jesus came, they confronted him, and they said to him, uh, Moses in the law says this, but what do you say? And they often challenged him to see whether he lined up with the law or not. And if you really think about it, they were strong on the law and strong on Moses. But when it came to Jesus, they wanted nothing to do with him. So there's a pendulum, right? They focused on the commandments of God, but they didn't want anything to do with Jesus. And if you look, if you go down through history, uh, I think it's very similar today that there are a lot of churches, I'm not specifically referring to our churches, but there are some among our churches as well, that they've gone to the opposite side. They want to talk about Jesus, and they want to lift up Jesus and preach about Jesus. But if you start talking about Moses and, and about the law of God, they don't really want that. So you see the pendulum. Pharisees focused on Moses. They didn't want Jesus. Today, a lot of people want to talk about Jesus, but they don't want the law. Now, if you look at the history of the Adventist church, of our church, you see these pendulums swinging back and forth as well. Uh, the early Adventists went through the Great Disappointment in 1844. They continued to study their Bibles. They discovered that the sanctuary was not on earth, but it was in heaven. It was a heavenly temple, and that just like the earthly temple had two apartments, so the heavenly temple has two apartments, and they found out about the uh, most holy place. They read in the Bible, Revelation 11:19, that says the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark was seen. And as they learned more about the heavenly temple and the ark, they, they studied and they realized that inside the ark was the Ten Commandments. And as they went down through the Ten Commandments, they discovered that one of those commandments is the fourth commandment about the Sabbath. And so that's how the early Adventists eventually became Seventh-day Adventists, which was because they followed the prophetic many of the Adventists were so focused on the law and the Sabbath that they, who did they neglect? They neglected Jesus. And uh, one time the little lady, um, Ellen White, in our history, she said, we have preached the law, the law, until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. Our, our ministers and our leaders have talked so much about the commandments that we've left Jesus out. So the pendulum swung more toward the law, just like it was with the Pharisees during the time of Jesus. 
Uh, and yet, I think today, like I mentioned, I think in some circles, we've gone to the other side. And we have focused um, a lot on Jesus, but people don't really want to talk about the commandments very much. And, uh, and I've done, I, wrote, I wrote a whole book on this called God's Last Message, Christ Our Righteousness. I don't think we have it at our booth, but you can get it from White Horse Media. And in that, in that book, I go through these different... Uh, swings of the pendulum, and then I talk, to, and then I talk about how uh, in the year 1888, which was over 100 years ago, in a, uh, in a place called Minneapolis, Minnesota, a group of our leaders came together for a big uh, conference, and there were a couple of uh, men from, from California. Some good things can come out, out of California. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I... I grew up in California, but now I'm in Idaho. But anyway, um, these two young men, Jones and Wagner, uh, what they did was they, they preached the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus together, especially Wagner. Wagner gave a whole series of talks at the uh, conference in Minneapolis, and Ellen White was sitting in the audience, and she said, I see the beauty of the presentation of the righteousness of Christ in relationship to the law that Dr. Wagner has presented before us. So the bottom line was that over a hundred years ago, as part of our movement, there was a renewed or new emphasis on the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus coming together. And that's what the text says, isn't it? The text says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And there is just so much confusion uh, in the religious world and even in some circles uh, within, our own ch uh, within our own church about how these two come together. How does the law and the gospel of Jesus come together? And that's what I want to study with you uh, today. So turn to the book of James. Turn to the book of James. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. In verse 22, James uh, chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, or in the margin of my Bible it says, in a mirror. He's like a person who looks at himself in a mirror. What, what did I say, chapter 2? Two? I'm sorry, chapter 1. Made a mistake. Yeah, chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. For he beholds himself, and then he goes his way, and he immediately forgets what manner of man he was. Verse 25, but whoso looks into, and what are we looking at? Whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So in this verse, Paul, or uh, James, is saying that uh, we need to look, verse 25, just like in a mirror, we look into the perfect law of liberty. Look at the perfect law and continue therein, and don't be a forgetful hearer, but be a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. Uh, the law of God is like a mirror. And when we look at the mirror, we see things that we don't see if we don't look at the mirror. Uh, just think about what happens when you get up in the morning. You get up in the morning, and uh, most of us at some point pretty early on go into the bathroom, and then there's a mirror there in the bathroom, and you take a look and see how you look, right? 
Uh, and a lot of times what we see when we look in the mirror in the morning, uh, we wish things were a little bit different. <laughs> Agree? Can you relate, relate to that? And God's law is like a mirror. It's a mirror that shows us things. Uh, and there's a lot of verses I could just quote. Uh, 1 John 3, 4, we know this well. It says, sin is the transgression of the law. Uh, Romans 3.20 says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Uh, Romans 7.7, 7, Paul says, I would not have known sin except by the law. And when I looked at the law, the law said, you shall not covet. And then Paul learned more about his character when he looked at the law. So the law is like a mirror. We look at the law, we look at the perfect law, and it shows us things in our lives that we wouldn't see if we weren't looking at the law. Now, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And just for the record, uh, Paul is very clear, and we need to be very clear, that we are not saved by the law. We're not saved by the mirror. If you look at yourself in the mirror and you see some things that you don't like, do you ask the mirror to clean you up? No. 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 If you, uh, and especially the guys, you know, men, if you're out working in the yard or somewhere and you're, you're at the end of the day and you come home and you're very dirty because you've been working and then you, you go inside the house and you look in the mirror and you see the dirt on your face, do you ask the mirror to cleanse the dirt off of you? No, you don't. Uh, if you're really dirty, what do you know you need to do? Yeah, you need to get in the shower. That's right, the mirror shows you the dirt and then you get in the shower. And when you get into the shower, uh, hopefully you have a bar of something there. A bar of what? A bar of soap. That's right. And you you use the soap to cleanse and, and uh, scrub yourself from the dirt that you just saw in the mirror. Are you following me? Simple illustration, simple analogy. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is very clear in verse 1. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you first, first of all that which I also received. So here is the first message, the most important message, and Paul says this is the gospel. A lot of times people wonder, what is the gospel? You've heard the word gospel. The word gospel means the good news. And what is the good news according to the Bible? The first angel's message has the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So the three angels' messages starts with the gospel, and then it ends with, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It ends with Jesus. It starts with Jesus. But the commandments of God are right there in the three angels. It's the conclusion of the third angel. And sometimes there's confusion. What is the gospel? And I've heard different ideas. But I look at my Bible, and Paul tells me very clearly, verse 3, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Here is the gospel. He's defining the gospel. He's telling us what the gospel is. The gospel is that Christ, the Son of God, our Savior, what did he do? He died. And why did he die? Not just for sins, but for our sins. That means your sin and my sin. He died for all of our individual sins. And this is the message, and not according to Steve Wahlberg or not according to speculation, but he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is the gospel according to the scriptures. And we know what sin is, right? If, if Jesus died for our sins, what does that mean? What, 
what out are our sins? What is sin? Right, sin is breaking the law. Paul says in Romans 3.20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. So here's the point. When we look at the mirror and we see our sins, like it says in James 1.25, look into the mirror, see what you are. As we look into the mirror and see our defects of character where we are not in harmony with the law, we don't, we don't ask the mirror to save us because the mirror can't save us and the mirror can't cleanse us. So then what we do is we get into the shower and we grab the soap to use the, an analogy. And uh, the analogy is that the shower, or especially the soap, uh, can be compared to, to Jesus who paid the price for our sins who died for the sins that the law shows us according to the scriptures. He died for every single sin that we've ever committed. Whatever sins you've done, whatever sins I've done, that the law of God points out, that's what the commandments of God shows us. The good news is that Jesus paid the price on the cross and died for every single sin that you've ever committed, that I've ever committed, and every Democrat has ever committed, every Republican, uh, the vaccinated, the unvaccinated, uh, whether we're Americans or uh, Russians or Chinese or whatever country we're from, whatever religion we're you know part of, uh, this applies to the Catholics and the Baptists and the Adventists. It applies to people that are involved in witchcraft, agnostics, atheists, the whole lot of humanity. The whole lot of us. Jesus died on the cross for every single sin that every single human being has ever committed from the dawn of time to the end of the world. And that is the biblical good news, the biblical gospel that must be preached to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. I'm going to just walk you through quickly the Ten Commandments. I've done this many times, and I've had some people come to me and they say, Steve, I've been going to church all my life, and I've never had anybody take me through the Ten Commandments. I, I believe there needs to be a resurrection of the preaching of the Ten Commandments in this world. There's never been a time when people are more confused about what's right and what's wrong about moral issues. And, and God is, is in earnest to develop a people in these difficult, challenging days where every wind is blowing and uh, all the, the, the winds of immorality are blowing. God is in, in uh, very, he's very earnest with us in trying to lead a people to take a full look at the mirror to look at the law of God God's law was not nailed to the cross the ceremonial law was nailed to the cross but not the Ten Commandments not the Ten Commandments Jesus did not die to take away the Ten Commandments he died to take away our sins Amen. not the Ten Commandments and we need to be very clear on that now, let's, let, let's go through the Ten Commandments. Because remember, the third angel's message concludes, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let's bring them together in light of Scripture. Uh, verse 1, Exodus 20, verse 1, says, God spoke all these words. And let's just stop right there. Uh, there's a lot of words that are being spoken today in this world. Isn't that right? Words on social media, uh, words that are being written, words on TV, words from ministers and preachers and pastors and uh, theologians and priests and rabbis, and the list just goes on and on. There's a lot of words. And God has convicted me that the most important words are his words. 
it says here that God spoke all these words. These are the words that God's, God wants us to think about. Many times in the, during the night season, as I'm laying in bed, I will go through the Ten Commandments one by one. And I just uh, thought about this a lot. God spoke all these words, and I've decided that for me, uh, I don't want any golden calves like the Israelites bowed down to when they came out of Egypt. I don't want to base my, my faith and my life on philosophy or psychology or um, the traditions of men. I want to base my life and my faith and my future on what God says in his word. God spoke all these words, and he said, I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So he spoke these words on Mount Sinai to uh, the Israelites that had come out of Egypt. They were all gathered together. The mountain was had been smoking. The ground had been shaking. It was smoking like a furnace, and the people were trembling. And they looked and they saw this manifestation of the glory of God. And then there was a period of awful silence. And then they heard the words that rolled down from the mountain. God spoke all these words. And he said, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of what? Bondage. Out of the house of bondage. Now stop right there. Some people think the law of God is bondage. They think we need, uh, now because of Jesus, we're free from the bondage. That is a, uh, that's a lie. God's law is not bondage. Here, God says, I brought you out of bondage to give you my law. And to me, that's very impressive. God gives us his law because he doesn't want us to be in bondage. Yeah. He brings us out of bondage to give us his law. Now here's another point. Um, God brought Israel out of Egypt. How did he do it? He, he did it with a mighty hand, an outstretched arm. He raised up Moses, and he sent ten plagues upon the Egyptians. Because remember, Pharaoh did not want to let the Israelites go. But finally... There was the tenth plague, and that was the last straw. And then he said, get out of here. Go. And what was that tenth plague? That's right. It was, the, it was the angel of death went through the land, and he went to every uh, house, every room, and he looked at the doors to see whether the blood of the lamb was on the doors or not. And for the Israelites, and then there were some Egyptians that came into some of the Israelites' uh, homes, if, if the Israelites or if the Egyptians were in a house that had blood on the doors, then the angel of death passed over. And that's where the Passover comes from. The idea of the Passover is that the angel of death passed over their homes because he saw the blood. And it was the blood of a lamb. And what does the blood of the Lamb represent? Jesus. Represents Jesus, right? The blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, and that's the gospel. So what you real, what's really happening here is God is giving the Israelites the Ten Commandments and giving them to us, and he's telling us uh, that he brought the, the Israelites out of bondage, and he did it under the sign of the blood of the Lamb so that he could give them his law. And that shows me the relationship between the blood and the gospel and Jesus Christ and the law of God. It's right there in the first commandment, isn't it? Right there. And then he says, you shall have no other gods before me. I'm to be number one in your life. And this is what we need to do. We need to look at the mirror, look at the law. We need to pray, Lord, open my eyes. Give me the Holy Spirit. Give me the spirit of truth. Show me in my life 
where I have veered away from your perfect law of liberty, your perfect mirror that is your will for my life, and show me if there's any place where I have put something else before you. And if we look at the mirror and hear the voice of God telling us that we that we've, we're supposed to put him first, and if we haven't done that, and if you look back at your life, can you think of some areas where you haven't done that? Where you haven't put the God of the Bible first in your life? And if you do that, if you look at the mirror and see your dirty face, then what do you do? Do you say, mirror, mirror on the wall, please cleanse me? No. You don't expect the law to clean you up. What do you do? You get into the shower. You, you grab the soap. And what, what essentially means is you get on your knees and you say, Lord, I, I have sinned. I've broken the first commandment. I've had other gods before you. I'm sorry for what I've done. And I ask you to wash me from my sin by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross which was represented by the blood that was put on the doors in Egypt. Right? So it becomes a, a personal experience. Now, God doesn't want to discourage us when he shows us our sins. No. He wants to show us our sins, but he doesn't want to discourage us. He wants to encourage us that the blood of Jesus is, is right there to cleanse you from your sin. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, and I've, do, I've gone down through them one by one. I can't tell you how many times. Many times I'm laying in my bed at night and I go through number one, number two, number three. I think I've memorized uh, the Ten Commandments. I've taught them to my kids when they were little, one by one. I even made up a song. See a guitar there. I'm not going to even try to sing it in front of you because it's been a long time since I wrote it, but I wrote a little song about the Ten Commandments, and I used to play the guitar, and I would sing the song to my kids, and one time we all got up in church and sang that song, the Wahlberg family, and Seth was probably like seven years old, or maybe eight, and Abby was like five, and we all got up and we went through one by one the Ten Commandments. Praise the Lord. So that's the first commandment. God needs to be first, and if we've sinned, we come to the gospel, we confess our sin, and Jesus cleanses us. Number uh, two, you shall not make to you, to you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. It's amazing when you really look at this commandment, God, just like he, there's saints and sinners, so this commandment says there's two groups of people in this world. There are those that hate him and those that love him. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, there's only going to be two groups. There's the wheat and the tares, the wise and the foolish, the righteous and the wicked, the saved and the lost, the saved uh, and the sinners, you know, the saints and the sinners. There's only two groups. And this commandment has two groups. People uh, hate God, which is really what Lucifer does. He hates God. And uh, the angels that went with Lucifer, they hate God. But the angels that stayed with God, they love him. And God wants us to love him, not to hate him. And if you look in your life and look at your past, and if you've realized that there's been times when you've hated God, if that's the case, it doesn't mean you're lost. It just means you need to come and get into the shower and realize that God so loved the world that he gave his son. He loves even those who hate him. That's amazing. God even loves those who hate him. 
And this commandment's really about idolatry, about images, graven images. And most of us aren't tempted with bowing down to some statue. Let's say this was a statue of Buddha or some statue, you know, the golden calf. Uh, most of us are not tempted to bow down to a, to a statue. But we have other idols. Uh, it, is, it has convicted me that if I have, that, that even, you know, images inside your head can become idols. It doesn't necessarily have to be a graven image. It can be a mental image. We can have a mental image of certain people or certain things, or there could be real things, or whatever it is that we bow down to, that we worship, that we put above the Lord, that is an idol. And God wants to cleanse his people from all their idols, from all their golden calves, from all their um, idolatry where they are putting things or people or images or whatever it is above the Lord. That's the second commandment. God wants to be first. And he says in verse 6 that he shows mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Some people say, well, that's just Jesus' commandments, not the Ten Commandments. But I thought about that, and I thought, did you know that Jesus is actually quoting verse 6? And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's quoting commandment number 2 that says, he shows mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Jesus is quoting the second commandment. It's a good text, Jordan, for an evangelistic meeting. I, I, I said that very thought. <laughs> yeah, but good for you. It's a great text. So that's so first commandment, God first. Second commandment, no idols. And if you are honest, and if you look at your heart, and if you look at the mirror, and if you let the Holy Spirit convict your mind, mm -hmm. your conscience, and if you realize if there's that nagging suspicion inside of you that you have been an idolater in your life, then what do you do? You get into the shower and you grab the soap and you say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've done these things and I pray that you'll forgive me and wash me from my sins in your blood. Pass over me through the blood of the Lamb. That's number two. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. If he doesn't hold us guiltless, then what does he hold us? Guilty, guilty right? The opposite of guiltless is guilty. You've seen a, a chocolate serve, you know, they'll say guilt, guilt free. Yeah. <laughs> you can eat this, uh, this, this dessert because it's kosher. It doesn't have all the junk in it. So it's you know, guiltless, guiltless eating. Well, we're either guilty or, or we're guiltless. And what, once a person is guilty, can the law save you? And that's what Paul says in Romans. He said that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Once we realize that the law of God is God's perfect standard and it shows us our sin, and if we realize that we've broken God's law and we're guilty, then at that point, salvation by the law is out. It's out the window. It is impossible for your guilt to be removed by any act of obedience. That's why Paul said that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. But the law gives you the knowledge of sin. It shows us our guilt. And once we realize that we're guilty, then our only recourse is to come to Jesus and say, Lord, on the cross, you became guilty for me. You took my guilt upon yourself, and you suffered, and you agonized, and you unselfishly died for me and for my sin to pay the price so I could be forgiven and stand before you and before your law as if I never sinned. And that's the only way it can ever happen. I'm very clear in my book, uh, God's Last Message, Christ Our Righteousness, that the only way that we can be saved and justified and forgiven and transformed is through the grace and the mercy and the blood 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And we need to be very clear on that. Very, very clear on that. Uh, the fourth commandment or third commandment says don't take God's name in vain. We can call ourselves Christians and we can live like the devil. And God really wants to clean his people up. He wants to transform sinners and make them saints. So they do not take God's name in vain. They speak his name reverently and they live what they believe. Uh, verses 8 to 10, 11, we know this commandment very well. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The seventh day is God's holy day. And, if, and it's not just, he's not just calling us to, to be uh, Saturday keepers. He's calling us to be Sabbath keepers. He's not just calling us to go to church on the right day. He's calling us to keep that day holy. It's a, it's a holy day. It's a separate day from the rest of the work days, and it's a day when we are to focus on our relationship with our maker. Mm -hmm. Now, something else that I've been, I just learned and as I thought about this, the Sabbath day is not, the fourth commandment is not just a call to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. It's also a call to work during the six days. Amen. And this impressed me when I did my, my research. I mentioned to you yesterday that I... Uh, I have a whole uh, finance course that I've done a lot of research on. It's called Grow Your Money with God, and it goes through the Ten Commandments as part of the course. Uh, the website is growyourmoneywithgod.com, and the principles of the course are that we need to get a job, we need to work, we need to be responsible, we need to put God first in our lives, we need to do the best we can to get out of debt, we need to build up a, an emergency fund, we need to be faithful to God in our tithes and our offerings, and then it also deals with the issue of what do we do with the rest of our money? Uh, how to, should we invest our money in any way for our future? And do that in a way that's not gambling. And anyway, uh, it's, been, it's impressed me as I've looked at the law that there's a lot of people today that don't want to work. You know, they'd rather just get a government check. A lot of people these days, now there are times to get government checks, I'm not saying never take a government check if I live long enough I, I will take social security I'm planning on that I think I'm going to wait a little while to get that that God has impressed me that uh, we need to be not just resting on the seventh day but we also need to be working while we can while we have energy while we're capable of working it's very important for us to get a to get a job Remember I talked about yesterday, Haggai says uh, they were earning wages, but their money was going into a bag with holes. And God wanted to plug up those holes by having them put him first in their lives. But so anyway, uh, if we look at this and we realize we haven't kept the Sabbath holy and rested on God's day, rested trusting in him, and we also haven't really, we've been lazy and we haven't done our part, uh, getting a normal job and getting a good job and developing our abilities and our talents that God wants us to do. If we look in the mirror and we see some defects, then what do we do? We get in the shower, we come to Jesus, and we say, Lord, I'm sorry that I have failed you in my life in this way or that way. I haven't really kept the Sabbath. I haven't really been a good uh, worker in your in the world, being responsible, and we need to trust in Jesus Christ alone and his blood and his grace to wash us from our sins. And, and of course, God's goal, as we look at these commandments, is not just to admit our failures, but by his grace then to start becoming better commandment keepers. He doesn't want us to say, Lord, I've had other gods before you and I'm going to keep on doing that. He doesn't want us to say, I've had my golden calves and I'm just going to keep on doing that. He doesn't want us to say that we've taken his name in vain and then we're going to keep on doing it. 
He doesn't want us to say, well, we, we haven't kept the Sabbath and we haven't been responsible uh, workers and we're just going to keep on doing it. You know, now I'm not saying that, uh, you know, the whole issue of men and women and I believe that for a woman to work in the home and to have a, you know, be a good mother, that also is the work of God, right. for sure. No doubt about it, but anyway... There's a lot of depth in God's law. So number uh, number five, Exodus 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. It's, it has uh, spoken to my heart, and I've meditated on this commandment. One day it hit me that God is saying to me, He wanted me to honor my father and my mother. And it doesn't say honor your perfect father or your perfect mother. Your parents aren't perfect. And your parents weren't perfect. And if you're a parent, you're not perfect. You've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. But nevertheless, God wants us to honor our parents. So I did the best I could when I, as, when I became Christian to honor my mom, Sandy Wahlberg. I was right with her when she died. I crawled up on her bed, on the bed on, in a nursing home right before she breathed her last breath. Mm -hmm. I whispered in her, in her ear and I said, Mom, Jesus loves you. Amen. Trust in him. Amen. And I was right with my dad, actually, right before he died uh, in a nursing home as well. And there was a man that was with him when he died. And the last thing my dad did was he reached out his hand to this man that was there at his bedside. He, my dad was 89, and he grabbed his hand, and he, my dad said, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And then he died. And I'm very confident that my dad is going to be in the resurrection Amen. of the righteous. And I don't know what your relationship is like with your parents. I don't know, what, I don't know any, anything about that. But I know that God's plan is for us to honor our parents, even though they make mistakes, even though big mistakes. And, uh, and if you look at the law of God and if you realize, Lord, I haven't really done that. And if your parents are still alive and if you haven't really done that, praise God, you have, you have a little bit of time to refocus on your mom and your dad if you're still alive. And if you haven't done that, if you've failed, if you've made mistakes, if you've sinned, if you looked at the mirror, then you get in the shower and you say to Jesus, Lord, I'm sorry, I, have, I haven't done this. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me and to help me to become a commandment keeper, not a commandment breaker. Commandment number six, you shall not kill. Now, this doesn't only mean pulling the trigger and taking somebody's life. Uh, we can kill ourselves. When you read uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, the chapter of the law given to Israel is very enlightening. There's, it's a comment on every single command. Read Patriarchs and Prophets, the chapter called the law given to Israel, and it illuminates every single commandment. And it says in, the, in that book that uh, overwork, if we overwork ourselves, we're breaking the sixth commandment because we're killing ourselves by overwork. If we have habits, unhealthy habits, we can be killing ourselves by our unhealthy habits. Uh, the New Testament says that if you hate your brother in your heart, you are a murderer. So the sixth commandment is deep. It talks about not just physically taking somebody's life, but slowly killing your own life unnecessarily or hating other people. Uh, and we really need to search our hearts we need to go deep. We're in the time when the Lord is developing a people that are described in the third angel. He's develop, developing a group of saints who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus and who understand that we're not saved by the commandments. The commandments are a mirror that show us our sins. And when we see our sins, we come to the gospel. We come to Jesus. And Jesus washes us by his grace and, and then helps us to line up with his law. 
That's the biblical blend between the law and the gospel. It's very important. A lot of hatred in this world. A lot of hatred on social media. Have you noticed that? I've never seen such hostility, such hatred uh, between Democrats and Republicans and between you know, this or that group. I've just never seen anything like it. And, and God wants us to be above this. He's developing a people who don't hate others. They don't hate their neighbor. They don't hate people that are that are different than they are. Now, they might, we might disagree with them. We might not see eye to eye on a lot of issues. But God does not want us to have hatred in our hearts. We need to be above that. And it says in Desire of Ages that Jesus only hated one thing. And that was sin. And by the way, uh, if I were to ask you this question, did Jesus ever have hatred in his heart? I think a lot of times the answer would be, you just, no, he didn't. But that's not true. Jesus did have hatred in his heart. He did. But he didn't hate people. He hated sin. It says that in Desire of Ages. He hated only one thing, and that was sin. He loved he hated the sin, but he loved the sinner. God help us. That's part of commandment keeping. That's God's will for us. We hate the sin, but we love the sin. Whether the sinner is in our church, or, or in the conference, or at the general conference, or in another church, or even if it's the Pope. We don't hate the Pope. We hate the sin. And we love the sin. That's commandment number six. Number seven, verse 14, is you shall not commit adultery. Now, you read it in Patriarchs and Prophets, and, it's, and Jesus also said uh, the classic definition of adultery is, is a married couple, and one of them is unfaithful and goes out with somebody else. That's classic adultery. But fornication also fits in here, too which is when people are with uh, other people before they're married. If you're not married, abstain and wait until you're married. And when you get married, we're we are to be faithful to our spouses. That's God's perfect plan. And Jesus said it's not just outward adultery, but if a man or a woman thinks lustful thoughts and continue to dwell on these lustful thoughts towards somebody else, uh, that's committing adultery in the heart. Right? Jesus didn't get rid of the law of God. No, no, no. He showed its depth, its spiritual depth. And then he pointed people to himself as the Savior. So this, uh, this commandment applies to going on the computer and going to websites we should never go on. It applies to pornography. It applies to lustful thoughts. It applies to watching TV programs that are immoral that we should not be watching, where there are uh, lustful scenes. We should be avoiding all this. And if we look at our conscience and look at our hearts and look at the mirror and realize, wow, Lord, I have, I have blown it. I have messed up, which we all have in one way or the other. We all meet together as sinners at the foot of the cross. If we realize we've sinned and we've done these things, then don't get discouraged. Don't think that you're lost. Don't think that God doesn't love you. Don't think that there's no hope for you. There is hope for you. Get in the shower. Grab the soap. Have faith in Jesus Christ, who paid the price for your sins. That is the gospel. Uh, verse 15, commandment number 8. You shall not steal which means taking something from somebody else that doesn't belong to you. And as I thought about this, and, and again, and as I've done research not only in the Ten Commandments, the third, or the third angel's message, but I've also started thinking about money and finances and how does all this apply to the law of God as well. I've been convicted that if we follow the fourth commandment and if we get a good job and if we work, then we're a lot less likely to be tempted to steal, right? Uh, Paul said in, in Ephesians, let him who stole, let him steal no more, but let him work with his hands so he has something to give to those in need. Mm -hmm. So the principle is get a job, work, develop an income, 
so that we can, we don't need to steal, but we've got our own, and then we can give to others who need our help. That's the whole purpose of making money. The purpose of making money is not to get rich and fatten our wallets and have all the you know, riches of this life. The purpose of making money, and I'm not opposed to making money, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil, but not money. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. And how does God's work go forward these days? Money. 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 Why are we taking up an offering at this camp meeting for, what was it, five, six thousand dollars It's because this camp meeting needs money. Why do uh, we give our tithes and our offerings to the church for the pastors and for ministries like Impact Hope and Whitehorse Media and other ministries that need uh, support? It's because God's work needs money. And I thought about this and I thought, where are we going to get that money? <laughs> you know, the emphasis shouldn't just be on giving. It also needs to be on making because you can't give what you don't make. Right? That's a flip side to that coin. God's work advances because people have earned and developed income so they can give to God's work, whether it's a little or a lot. If you have a little, like the two mites, or if you have more like Abraham did, who was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Uh, and Job. Job had, they were very wealthy. There were people in the Bible that were very wealthy, people that were poor, and uh, it's just impressed me that God's work advances around the world, the three angels' message, because his people give. And the only way we can give is if we earn. We have to do what the fourth commandment says and work in order for us to earn so we can give and help advance God's work. These principles are part of the law of God, part of God's commandments. Uh, number, number nine, verse 16, says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And by the way, back to the sixth commandment, if God has convicted you that you have stolen something in, the, in your life, then you need to make that right. You need to uh, confess that to God and then repay what you stole. The Bible talks about that. Repay what we've stolen. So God wants us to do these things and be responsible. Uh, verse uh, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Ninth commandment. And this is a big one. And as I look at so many posts on social media, I look at emails I get from some people, I, I see all this controversy and this and that, I think to myself, everybody needs to really take seriously the ninth commandment, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. I spoke on this at 3 a.m. a week ago, a week ago today, I gave a whole talk uh, about Jesus being the branch, being connected to the branch, and the importance of becoming a people in whose mouth is no God. No deception. And God wants us to put a check on our words and to be very, very careful when we make comments about other people. Uh, in Mount, Mount of Blessings, page 68, it says, it talks about uh, when we comment upon the motives and the actions of others, that we should be very careful when we do that. And she says, how often preconceived ideas, uh, errors of judgment, mental bias, preconceived opinions, all these different things color our understanding of what we're talking about. When Peter was on the mountain with Jesus and Moses and Elijah appear, Peter said, uh, let, let me make, let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then the Bible says that Peter said this not knowing what he was saying. In, uh, in Timothy, Paul says there are people that are teachers that they want to be teachers of the law, but they have no idea what they what they so confidently affirm. They have no idea what they're saying. Peter said, though everybody else deny you, I never will. Was he right? No, he wasn't. He was totally wrong. And it's so easy to say things about other people when we really don't know what we're talking about. And that is... If we bear false witness against somebody else and say something about someone that isn't true, then we're sinning. We've broken the law. We're bearing false witness. 
And God wants to impress us with these things, speak to our consciences, have us search our hearts, look at our lives, look at the mirror, and if we realize that we've, we've done things we shouldn't have said, or said things that we really didn't know what we were saying, that were unfair and unjust, like it says in Revelation, one day those who are unjust will be unjust still. Those who are filthy will be filthy still. Those who are righteous are righteous still, and those who are holy are holy still. Two groups. And God wants us not to be unjust in the things that we say about other people. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of this, don't get discouraged, but be open to the, to the Lord's conviction. And then get in the shower, get on your knees, say, Lord, I'm sorry, I've sinned. Wash me in your blood and help me to do better. Help me to speak the truth when I open my mouth. And when I write an email or post on a YouTube post or a Facebook post or whatever I do, God, help me to speak the truth. That's what uh, Jesus did and everything he did. Verse 17, covetousness. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, or donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So your neighbor has things. He has a house. He has uh, a wife. He has uh, even manservants or maidservants. This is the person that's that's been really responsible in his life, and he's not just uh, an employee, but he's actually an employer, where he's got servants who work for him. That's not something that we all have to do, but it still shows that God values responsibility, responsibility in, in life. And uh, covetousness is not is really something that is not an action. Uh, taking God's name in vain is an action with your words. Keeping the Sabbath is an action. Keeping the seventh day. Um, committing adultery can be an action, uh, being unfaithful, morally. Um, the commandments deal with many actions, but it also deals with the heart. And this commandment is not dealing primarily with actions. It's dealing with the heart. And it says in Patriarchs and Prophets that, that the, the Tenth Commandment strikes at the root of all sin, mm -hmm. which is the selfish desire. And that's what Lucifer experienced in heaven. He became selfish, and he wanted to take God's place. He actually wanted to be worshipped. I was reading recently when it talks about the, the three temptations of Jesus. The third one, Lucifer took Jesus up to a great high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, world, and he said, I'll give you all these things if you will just bow down and worship me. And I looked and I thought, there it is. There's the real root of sin. When Lucifer was in heaven and he saw all the angels bowing down and worshiping God, he thought, I want that for myself. I want them all to worship me. And that was a selfish desire. And God wants to take that out of us. He wants to shine a light on it, expose it, it goes beyond actions and words. It goes down to the deepest depths of the human heart. And I dare say that we all have that tendency inside of us, don't we? And if the Holy Spirit convicts us and shows us the root of all sin, which is covetousness and the selfish desire, then we realize we realize, oh God, there's no way that I can get this out of my life on my own, right? Can you overcome your own heart on your own? You can't. And that shows us, probably more than anything else, our desperate need for the gospel and for the blood and for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. By grace you're saved through faith, not of yourself, 
It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. If we boast, then who are we like? We're like the devil, because he was the first boaster. And I just, you know, for me, as a, as a public speaker, I'm in front of audiences, God has just impressed me, Steve. I want to take out of your heart any desire for you to be worshipped or praised or uh, put on a pedestal. Now, I don't mind words of appreciation and encouragement, but I don't want to be worshipped. I don't want to be an idol. I don't want people to bow down and, you know, think that I'm anything great because I'm not. Uh, I see Charles nodding his head. You know, all of us that are speakers, whether we're, it's Doug Bachelor, Stephen Bohr, uh, Charles, me, you know, uh, Jordan, uh, any of the public speakers, I call it the peril of the spotlight. You know, we don't need worship. We don't need that kind of honor. It's not good for us. We weren't designed for that. We're all designed to worship God and not man. So we appreciate your prayers and uh, your encouragement, but we do not need to be put on any kind of a pedestal because only God should be in that position, not man. And I think we have some cleaning up in our church in that area. And uh, again, we realize, Lord, I can't do it on my own. Jesus, you're the only one that can give me a new heart. Change my heart. Give me a heart that instead of being selfish, is unselfish. Instead of only looking out for number one, I'm looking out for you. I'm interested in you. I want to help you. I want to be a blessing to you. I want to focus your eyes on Jesus and not on man. This is all part of the Ten Commandments. This is all part of keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, one more uh, point before we wrap this up is this. In Matthew 22, Jesus, quoting the Old Testament, summarized the Big Ten. A lawyer came up to him and asked him a question. In Matthew 22, verse 35, then one of them which who was a lawyer, a lawyer was not like an attorney, but it was someone that was skilled in the law back then. He came to Jesus and asked him a question, and he was tempted. And he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? When you look at the law of God, which is the most important? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And that is a summary of the first four commandments. The first four commandments, God first, no idols, don't take his name in vain, keep the Sabbath holy, work and keep the Sabbath holy. Uh, those commandments are summarized in the principle of love. But because God is so good, because God cares for us, because even though we've been lost sinners, Jesus died on the cross for us. And our response to him should be a response of love. This is the first and the great commandment. And then he said, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Which means that I should treat you as if you were me. And somebody asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? It can't be those Samaritans. And then Jesus told the story of the good Samaritan. And the point is that to really keep the law of God, we, if you're a Republican, you need to love the Democrats. If you're a Democrat, you need to love the Republicans. No matter who you choose to vote or not to vote for President of the United States uh, in November of 2024, we need to still have compassion upon our neighbor, whoever he is. Whatever the color of their skin, whether they're black, white, Republican, Democrat, Catholic, Baptist, Adventist, conference employees, GC, layman, you know, we need to, G, let me ask you, does Jesus love all these people? Yes. He does. And if, if we're going to have his character, we need to be developing love. It doesn't mean we agree with everybody. 
doesn't mean that we don't sometimes, you know, stand up, take a stand, and rebuke somebody. doesn't mean that. But it means that you, have, that you really care for the people that you're talking about. If you don't really care about them, you don't love them as yourself. And you are breaking the law of God. You're violating the very principles of the character of God. And these things apply, uh, they're deep. They apply to us all. What's the difference between an accuser of the brethren and someone who is giving a, a rebuke? The difference is, is love. Jesus said, those who I love, I rebuke. But Satan is accuser, an accuser of the brethren. He just accuses, throws stones, and attacks people, and he doesn't care one whit about them, really, yeah. about what they're about, their person. And God wants us to be lovers of the Lord and lovers of people to speak the truth, to put him first. Uh, this is all part of the law of God. So let's go back to Revelation 14, verse 12. And we'll close with this. Revelation 14, 12. Jesus is working by the Holy Spirit to develop a people who understand the law and the gospel, how they go together. They believe in the Ten Commandments, but they know they're not saved by them. They're only saved by the gospel, by Jesus Christ, and by his blood. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here, here is the patient or the, the endurance. Sometimes it's tough, isn't it? You know, it's hard to love people sometimes. It's hard for people to love me. <laughs> and hard for me to love people. And it's the same for most of us. For all of us, probably. And we're, we need Jesus and we need his endurance. Here is the patient endurance on the part of the saints. God is developing saints in this world. Here are they that, that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They keep them because they first realize they broke them. And they come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness and cleansing. And by his grace and through the third person of the Godhead, through the Holy Spirit working in us, then little by little, step by step, day by day, point by point, uh, we can become commandment keepers. And we have the faith of Jesus. He's the center. He's the bottom line. He is he's it. Uh, one more thought before we pray. Um, I just thought I'd mention this, that there's a lot of talk these days about the word perfection. Well, does this mean these people are perfect? Have you ever wondered that or wrestled with that? Here's my thought. Uh, to me, the word perfect is not a bad word. It's not a dirty word. I would love to have a perfect marriage. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I would love to have perfect health. Wouldn't you? That sounds great. So to me, being perfect is a very good thing. Uh, one of these days, we're all going to be in the kingdom of God and everything's going to be perfect. There's going to be no sin. Doesn't that sound good? Amen. So to me, to me, uh, the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So I define perfection simply as keeping the commandments of God. That's the way I define it. I stick with the word. I'm not going to go beyond that. James talks about the perfect law of liberty. So if God, by his grace, can help me little by little, to become a commandment keeper through Jesus Christ, then I am developing by his grace a perfect char character. And uh, ultimately, those who are perfect will be perfectly happy. <laughs> It'll be fantastic. Uh, it's not a dirty word, but we can't get there on our own. We need the grace and the blood of Jesus. And I simply define the word as Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's a worthy goal. God wants us to be happy. And the more we're in harmony with his law, the happier we'll be. Let's, uh, let's pray.
Heavenly Father. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my, my thoughts. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, help us to look at your law, your perfect law of love, your law of love, and to see where we have um, strayed. May the Holy Spirit convict our consciences where we need convicting. May he convict us where we need convicting. And may he comfort us where we need comfort. And Lord, help us to be man and keepers in these last days when everything's up for grabs everything's going all over the place you are developing a people who keep your commandments in this wicked world and who trust in jesus as their savior and who love you and their neighbor as themselves bless us lord and make us this people we pray in jesus name amen, amen.